I want to thank everyone that's been able to join us real time today for one of our virtual Africa Partners Medical Continuing Medical Education sessions, or those of you that are watching this on our YouTube channel asynchronously. It's always a pleasure to be able to have an opportunity to invite a variety of talented speakers to join our ongoing continuing education efforts through Africa Partners Medical. Uh, today we have three speakers that will be uh, talking with our group. And for those that are able to join us real time, there will be some time for questions and answers. So our first speaker for today is Dr. Sagar Dugani, uh, who will be speaking to us about some aspects related to a common and important condition, that being diabetes mellitus. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and let Dr. Dugani uh, share his slides and do a little bit more of an introduction of what he'd like to cover with our group today. Thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about a very important topic, which is diabetes mellitus. So I will share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? All I see is a blank. I don't know if anyone else is seeing something different. Yes, it's blank with a Kesa. Nothing can be seen. Okay, it has shown up now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So thank you everyone for this opportunity for people who are listening live and for people watching the YouTube channel. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about diabetes mellitus. Uh, it's, a, it's a great topic and into a number of people and countries throughout the world. And so we hope this will be informative to uh, many people. My name is Sagar Dugani, and I'm a physician in the Division of Hospital Internal Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. I receive funding from the NIH, which is the National Institutes of Health, as well as from a Career Development Award at Mayo Clinic. I don't have any conflicts of interest for this presentation. Today, we will discuss the burden of type 2 diabetes. We will then move on to the diagnosis and management of type 2 diabetes. We'll talk about a consensus report on the management of diabetes, which fortuitously was published approximately two or three weeks ago. So we will be able to talk about some of the latest guidelines or recommendations on the management of type 2 diabetes. We'll briefly talk about essential medications as discussed by the World Health Organization. We'll summarize and then open it up for questions and discussion. Globally, there are approximately 435 million people who have type two diabetes. Approximately 80% of people with diabetes live in low and middle income countries. For context, in the United States, approximately 35 million people have diabetes. Diabetes poses a major public health problem. A high burden of diabetes is associated with high burden of morbidity and mortality. There is a high cost of medications because this is a chronic condition for the most part. This is also associated with the number of medical appointments, follow-up and lost wages. And it can also result in a low quality of life. Diabetes as a public health problem or concern is not restricted to certain countries in the world. It's a global problem. Here we have a report that was published two years ago, and this is based on data from several years. We have a color scheme, and that's shown in the bottom left, and the red goes from 10 million and higher. The orange is 5 to 10 million, and it goes in decreasing order. And we can look at all countries of the world have at least one color. Very few are without any data, showing that all countries to some to, to larger or smaller extents are affected by the prevalence of diabetes. We can look at some of the countries with the highest number of cases, and China has approximately 89.5 million people with diabetes, and the number five country is Mexico with 13.1 million people. Diabetes on its own is associated with a number of comorbidities. And one of the major complications that arises from diabetes is a higher risk of mortality. 
And now we're looking at death numbers throughout the world. And here we have approximately 100,000, uh, approximately 100,000 people here in red and higher. And then we go 50,000 to 100,000 in orange and so forth. And again, all countries to different degrees are affected by a diabetes related mortality. When we look at the number of deaths attributed to diabetes, India has the highest with approximately 250,000 and at number five is Mexico. Diabetes is a problem that affects almost all countries in the world. There are a number of professional societies that have released guidelines on the diagnosis and the management of diabetes. For the most part, the diagnostic criteria for most guidelines are similar. The management may vary a bit. Today, we will discuss mostly uh, findings or recommendations from the ADA and the EASD consensus statement that was published three weeks ago. And the ADA is the American Diabetes Association and the EASD is the European group that studies diabetes. And together they published a consensus statement. We will briefly talk about the ADA guidelines, but if one is interested, they could look at the Canadian Diabetes Association guidelines. There are guidelines from New Zealand and Australia, and a number of countries have released guidelines. And so this can get fairly complicated. For the most part, it's always helpful to look at the guidelines that are followed by a particular country. Sometimes there are individual countries release guidelines, or if they don't release their own guidelines, they at least have one of the major guidelines as their reference point. But we will talk mostly about the ADA and the EASD guidelines. The WHO also has some recommendations and provides some perspective on the diagnosis and management of type two diabetes, and uh, we'll share some of that too. Diabetes is a fairly complex problem. And we're only going to talk about type two diabetes, but we have type one diabetes and gestational diabetes, which are equally important. They have different pathophysiologies. They have different outcomes. They have different burdens compared to type one diabetes. And so we will not discuss type one diabetes and gestational diabetes. There are separate guidelines for this and they're very important topics that merit their own presentation and discussion. Briefly on the physiology of diabetes, we can start with the pancreas and the beta cells within the pancreas release insulin. Insulin has a number of effects on different tissues throughout the body, but some of its functions include to inhibit lipolysis, they inhibit glucose production in the liver, and they increase glucose uptake in muscle and fat cells. In both in, in cases related to the liver as well as the muscle, the ultimate effect is on the levels of blood glucose. When we start to get progressive loss of the beta cell function, this results in a decline in the amount of insulin that is released. There are a number of pathways that contribute to beta cell function decline. Not all pathways are well or fully understood. In instances where beta cell dysfunction occurs, there are a number of drivers for this. There may be a hereditary predisposition to beta cell dysfunction, uh, adipokines, which are hormones produced by adipocytes, inflammatory pathways may contribute to beta cell dysfunction, free fatty acids, and a number of other factors. And what, both, what all these factors can do is they can have an effect on beta cell dysfunction, or beta cell function, which affects the amount of insulin produced by the pancreas. These factors can also contribute to insulin resistance and insulin resistance affects the ability of insulin to have an effect. And this insulin resistance is largely experienced at the muscle and adipocyte levels, which means that the muscle and fat cells do not take up a lot of glucose and that extra glucose floats around in the blood, resulting in higher blood glucose levels. And this brings us to an important aspect of how diabetes is diagnosed. For now, most of the criteria are based on blood glucose levels and we'll talk about that in more detail briefly. One of the major 
topics that comes up is how do we screen people for diabetes and how do we know if someone is at risk for diabetes? For example, if we're at home today, we may ask ourselves, are we at risk of diabetes right now? The ADA, the American Diabetes Association Professional Practice Committee, published this self-assessment or self-screening tool to determine if you are at risk for diabetes now. This is based on modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. The major advantage of this is it's non-laboratory, and we'll take a look at the criteria in a second. Patients may do this at home. They can self-identify if they are at higher risk for diabetes. And if they are, then they can try and seek care from a healthcare provider. One of the major concerns about this risk score is we're not sure of the validation in non-US cohorts. This was developed using populations in the United States. And there have been some studies looking at other populations, for example, in South Korea and other places, but we don't have, we don't know if this will, if this score will work in all other populations. So let's take a look at this diabetes risk score. In the first point, they ask about age and you get different points. And if you're less than 40 years, you get zero points. And all the way up to 60 years or older, where you get three points. So this is an acknowledgement that the risk for diabetes goes up with age. So you can add your score in this box. And then they ask about whether the person who's doing this is a man or a woman. If the person answering this is a woman, then they ask about whether they had gestational diabetes. And this is acknowledging that gestational diabetes increases risk for diabetes later in life. Number four asks about family history. Number five asks about ever being diagnosed with high blood pressure. Six is about physical activity. And the guidelines recognize or, or acknowledge that the definition for physical activity is not perfect. And whether I consider myself physically active or whether someone else considers themselves physically active may vary. And in number seven, they ask about the weight category. And here they provide a table based on your height and weight and depending on where you fall. So let's say, for example, if you're five foot and one inch and you weigh between 132 and 157 pounds, you give yourself one point. If on the other hand, you're five feet and one inch and you weigh 211 or higher pounds, then you give yourself three points. And then what you do is you just add up all these points, you get your total score. And if you, get, if you score five or higher, then it means that you're at, you're at increased risk of having type two diabetes. This is not talking about risk one year from now, four years from now, or 10 years from now, it's talking about your current risk. So if I do this test and if I score six or seven, it means I'm at increased risk of diabetes now, which would prompt me to then speak to a healthcare provider, a physician, nurse, or someone else, and try and get tested for type two diabetes. There are concerns, as I mentioned briefly, about validation in non-US cohorts. There's also concern about everyone knowing their height or weight. And what about family history? Some people may not know if their father, mother, or someone else has diabetes. So there is some potential for not having complete information. Once a person screens for diabetes or through a separate mechanism, identifies that they may be at high risk, uh, the guidelines also talk about who should be tested for diabetes. And I'm not going to go through all these criteria, but it suffices to say that there are a number of criteria to decide if a person should be tested for diabetes. And sometimes it gets pretty complicated. For example, here in number one, they talk about testing to be considered in adults who are overweight or obese. They, in, in number two, they talk about patients with prediabetes. In three, they talk about women who are diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And for all other people, testing should begin at the age of 35. So the testing is based on a number of modifiable and non-modifiable factors. Some of them are related to race, ethnicity, family history, and other uh, heritable conditions. In general, everyone 35 years or older is eligible for testing. Younger age for testing is based on risk factors, which could be modifiable or non-modifiable risk factors. 
There is a large push in the literature and it hasn't made its way to guidelines just yet, but there is a large push to simplify these guidelines and not have several criteria, but maybe have something simpler where they say that everybody above a certain age gets screened and not, uh, and not have several criteria. But this is still in the research phase and it hasn't made its way into the mainstream guidelines. The diagnosis of type two diabetes is they're based on blood tests. And this is helpful in a way because it can be objective, but it's also challenging because in some places you might not have access to fasting blood glucose or hemoglobin A1C blood tests. These criteria are based on the ADA and they're very similar across our different society guidelines. The first criteria looks at fasting plasma glucose of greater than or equal to 126 or seven, depending on the units you use. Or you can have a two-hour plasma glucose of greater than or equal to 200. And this, uh, and this is during an oral glucose tolerance test. And this is based on a 75 gram glucose uh, load and checking your glucose two hours later. Some people find it inconvenient to fast. And some people also do not have the ability or the schedule or access to do an oral glucose tolerance test. In those cases, a hemoglobin A1C may be used. And the advantage of hemoglobin A1C is it doesn't require fasting status. And if the A1C is greater than 6.5, that would be consistent with the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Or there can be more classical symptoms of hyperglycemia or a hyperglycemic crisis. And many patients present to the hospital in hyperglycemic crisis, and that when they're diagnosed with diabetes, they had no, uh, they had no diagnosis prior to that. All these tests are based on some aspect of glucose or hemoglobin A1C, which again relates to the amount of glucose that's present in hemoglobin. While A1C has the advantage of not requiring fasting status, it's not widely available and can be expensive in some places and can be a cost prohibitive for some people. One of the things to note is also that the results for glucose and A1C may be discordant. And there have been reports where patients may have a fasting plasma glucose that is above 126, for example, 140 or 145, but the A1C is within normal limits. So it's not expected that the glucose and A1C always have to give the same result. And the guidelines address this, that if you do get different results where one test shows a diagnosis of diabetes and the other one does not, then they talk about repeating the test on a different day to see if uh, the result is still abnormal. Many factors can also affect A1C levels. For example, patients with anemia, patients who get blood transfusions, Patients with other hemoglobin or RBC red blood cell conditions might have different levels of A1C. The race and ethnicity also plays a factor, and this should be taken into account while determining whether a patient has diabetes. And that's one of the limitations now, and there's a lot of active research, is should these cut points of 126 here and 200 here and 6.5 be used for all races and ethnicities? Or do we need to have race and ethnicity specific cutoffs, recognizing that there may be some differences in uh, glucose or RBCs? The ADA EASD consensus report discussed management of type 2 diabetes. They did not refer to patients with type 1 diabetes, gestational diabetes, or children. They synthesized evidence related to diabetes all the way through to 2022. The guidelines are freely available on the web and um, it's highly recommended if anyone is interested in or has a responsibility to care for patients with diabetes. The fundamental aspects of diabetes are based on promoting healthy behaviors, also promoting physical activity, weight management, tobacco substance abuse if relevant, and also provide, providing psychological support. And the guidelines go farther than most other guidelines where they recognize that for an individual to take care of themselves, if it's a chronic condition for the most part, it can be fairly challenging. It can be psychologically weakening to take care of themselves, manage their weight, diet, 
lifestyle, work, family, and a number of factors. And therefore, it's important to provide supportive counseling or psychological support. We talked about the diagnostic cutoff of 6.5 to diagnose someone with diabetes. And the guidelines say that um, we should aim to have glycemic control, and that's based on A1C of less than equal to seven. It's not clear how low we should go. Is just anything less than seven good? How about 6.5 or six or 5.5? There have been some studies that showed being extremely aggressive in A1C control can result in hypoglycemic episodes can maybe associated with increased risk of mortality. So it's not clear that going extremely low is the right answer, but this is an area of research. Management or, uh, or glycemic control has an effect on the onset and progression of microvascular complications. And this relates to retinopathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy. But there's less clear evidence for glycemic control and effect on macrovascular complications, which may result, which may relate to myocardial infarctions or heart attacks or strokes. The association there is less clear. It's very difficult to have, have the same cutoff or have the same requirements for all patients. And therefore the target should be based on individual preference, what people are able to do realistically. It's also dependent on the number of hypoglycemic episodes they may be experiencing, as well as individual comorbidities. This is uh, the main goals of care or framework that the ADASD guidelines provide. And I'm not going to go through all of it because it, we could spend um, several hours discussing goals of care and how we would tailor treatment options to individual patients. But suffice to say that it's a fairly complex topic and we'll, we'll look at some of the major categories here. Starting at the top, it's important to assess the individual characteristics. What are the individual's priorities? How old is the person? Do they want to be aggressive? Are they able to be aggressive in their treatment? Do they have access to everything that is required to manage diabetes? Or are they in a place with limited resources? Do they have limited needs? Is their income limited? And so these are factors that need to be taken into account upfront before deciding how aggressive the treatment should be. When we consider specific factors in the, in the pink box here, it's about individual goals for both weight as well as overall well being. It's important to use a shared decision making approach. It's, it's no longer sufficient for a physician or healthcare provider to say, here are the 10 things you need to do or 15 things you need to do, and you absolutely need to do this and come back in three months with outstanding results. That's not going to work anymore. So we have to work with patients, ensure patients have access to DSMES, which is diabetes self-management education and support, which is the cornerstone of overall diabetes management. Ensure that we as physicians or healthcare providers understand what the patient's preference is, understand what their barriers are, understand what their beliefs are, and tailor our treatment according to that. And once we do that, we have to agree on a management plan, and we can use the SMART goals approach to come up with something that will work for the patient, all the while providing support and counseling when needed. We also have to implement a management plan for the patient and ensure there's regular review. And that, that regularity may depend on the patient. In some cases, it may be every three or four months. In some cases, if the patient is doing extremely well, it may be every six or seven months. But this is something that has to be tailored with the patient. And provide ongoing support and review and agree on the management plan. And if changes are going to be made, mutually agree between the patient and the provider that they're going to make these changes, they're going to see if this works and they're going to again have a review and follow up of the plans. What is central to management of type two diabetes is uh, DSMES. And this is being able to have self-management, education and support. And people have realized more and more that diabetes is complex. And it's going to be based on a holistic approach to lifestyle behaviors, being able to take medications on time, being able to afford medications, self-monitoring, and as well as coping and problem solving. 
This is tailored to the individual and the corona or the COVID pandemic has increased the use of telehealth, has increased the use of digital coaching and digital DSMES. And there are a number of app-based approaches to also provide this regular support to patients. There are a number of aspects and the guidelines go through all of this. They talk about each of these areas or goals here in, in greater detail. But I will talk about one or two aspects that seem to cross cut across uh, the different domains. For example, weight reduction is, is a major theme that comes up in the guidelines. And previously weight loss was seen as a way to improve glycemic control and improve the A1C. But now there is increased recognition that weight loss of five to 15% should be the target for most people. And this is not only to improve the A1C, but this is to improve overall metabolic health. More weight loss can be disease modifying and can also help with remission of type two diabetes. And we'll talk about this in a few minutes because the concept of diabetes remission is new and uh, an area that people are still trying to understand. Weight management is complex. Obesity is complex and trying to lose weight is also very complex for patients. One of the major challenges is obesity is often viewed as a result of personal choice. And this leads to stigma and it leads to challenges for the person who's trying to lose weight or manage weight and also for the person who's supporting them through this challenge. There are a number of individual and community factors. It's not always about a personal choice, but if a patient, for example, is not able to access a place to exercise, if a patient does not have access to healthy food, if a patient is not able to exercise, if the community is not safe, these are all community factors that may be well beyond the individual's control and may result in higher body weight and obesity. The guidelines go into behaviors that all of us could use to optimize our metabolic health and optimize our glucose profiles. I won't go through all of them, but we'll talk about the main bullet points. So the first one is sitting and breaking up prolonged sitting. So here they say every 30 minutes, and all of us can do this is try to minim uh, minimize the amount of time we sit. And every 30 minutes, if possible, try to stretch and get a little exercise. Stepping, and here some of the studies have shown an increase of about 500 steps a day, an increase of just 500 steps is associated with a two to 9% decreased risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Previously sleep didn't get a lot of attention. It, it was sort of viewed as an activity that people engaged in after they've done everything else that was important. But now sleep is getting its own place and people recognize that sleep is something that we have to make time for. We should have restful sleep, which may be between six and eight hours, maybe a little different for different people, but uh, it's important to get uninterrupted sleep, the right sleep duration, which is six to eight hours for most people, and also having regularity of sleep, where you sleep, you sleep at the same time, roughly speaking, uh, every day. Moderate to vigorous activity, which includes at least about 150 minutes of exercise every week. Physical activity and frailty. And these are a number of, these are situations where a patient may have some limitations or may develop advanced frailty due to uh, suboptimal metabolic health. And strengthening, this is the use of resistance exercise in addition, in addition to uh, cardiovascular exercise to promote overall glycemic control. The benefits are vast. And the way the benefits are described here is green shows strong evidence, yellow shows medium strength evidence, and red shows limited evidence. So here we can, and then we have a number of columns, which is glucose, insulin, blood pressure, all the way through quality of life. And these are the different behaviors that we uh, just reviewed. And I won't go through all of these, but you can see, for example, strengthening exercise. It's, it, there is strong evidence to reduce glucose. There is moderate or medium strength evidence to reduce blood pressure. 
strong evidence for A1C, et cetera. So a lot of these have some benefit on different aspects of metabolic health and diabetes. Non-pharmacologic approaches are very important to the management of diabetes. And in some cases, many patients go on to require glucose lowering medications. There are a number of categories. Metformin, which is the mainstay of glucose lowering therapy, and it's usually the first medication that is started for most people. It has multiple effects. It has uh, beneficial effects on the liver, muscle, adipocytes, and not all its functions are fully understood. It's even thought to be associated with uh, better aging and reduced risk for dementia. So metformin has a number of effects and we don't understand everything, but it is included as part of its glucose lowering uh, effect. Sulfonylureas increase insulin secretion in the beta cells. TZDs and DPP4 inhibitors, they can increase insulin sensitivity and augment insulin secretion. And newer medications that may not be available everywhere are SGLT2 inhibitors, which reduce blood glucose by increasing urinary loss of glucose. And GLP-1 receptor agonists, they augment insulin secretion and glucagon suppression. This is a fairly complicated slide, and I'm going to break it down. But Part of this is to also illustrate that the management of diabetes, as well as the use of glucose-lowering medications, is complex. So let's break this down by talking about the glucose-lowering medications first. We've reviewed the non-pharmacologic approaches, so we won't talk about them again. But the pharmacologic approaches, the mainstay is metformin for most people. And then other medication classes may be added. And a lot of these are going to depend on what the individual's weight management goals are, and they talk about different options here. If you're looking for weight loss, there are some medications that are associated with weight loss. There are some medications, for example, GLP-1 receptor agonists, they have an intermediate effect on weight loss, and some are weight neutral, such as DBP-4 inhibitors and metformin. So it depends on what the patient's goals are. If they have to control their glucose as well as manage weight, then it may be possible to consider some of these medications that are associated with weight loss. There are other medications that have different strengths and effects on glucose lowering, and those are outlined based on very high effect, high effect, or intermediate effect. What medications we use also depends on the presence of other conditions. Starting on the left, if the patient also has ASCBD, which is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, then the guidelines recommend what medications may be beneficial. If available, GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGLT2 inhibitors, will, uh, which have proven benefit for cardiovascular disease, would be recommended. If the patient, for example, has heart failure, there are recommendations to use SGLT2 inhibitors because there is benefit for heart failure patients uh, in this population. If the patient has diabetes and chronic kidney disease, then there are recommendations to use SGLT2 or GLP-1 receptor agonists, again, if they are available. There is limited availability of these medications, and in some places where they're available, they can be very expensive and cost prohibitive. The WHO has talked about the availability of medication. Recently, there's been a lot of attention on making insulin widely available because that is a mainstay for many people. The availability of medications depends on the country. The World Health Organization has developed an essential medications list, which has been adapted in many countries. And these are medications that should be affordable, available, and accessible to people everywhere. And a number of medications for diabetes are on the essential medications list, but not all of them are available. The cost of medications may be prohibitive for many people. And adherence is also difficult. Taking a medication every day, some medications twice a day, it's very easy to forget how to take these medications and it can be difficult to adhere. And this is the final slide, putting everything together. As we talk about holistic care, 
And this is from the consensus statement. Uh, I won't go through this because it summarizes a lot of things we discussed, but it talks about taking into account the patient's beliefs and values, what they're able to afford, what their goals are and what's realistic, what other medications and comorbidities they need to manage, and what is also available in the area with respect to medications. As a final slide, I will mention diabetes remission because this is not a concept we talked about or thought about until maybe last year. And that's when uh, a statement from the American Diabetes Association came out where they talked about diabetes remission. There are different ways to think about diabetes remission. The first one is partial remission. This is where hyperglycemia is below the threshold and without any pharmacotherapy. This doesn't talk about lifestyle. This is only talking about without pharmacotherapy, without using medications to lower glucose. So if a person is able to maintain this for at least one year without medications and have a glucose of less than 6.5, they're said to be in partial remission. Complete remission is if they have a normal glucose profile. So here they need to have complete remission, which is A1C is less than 6.5, and the fasting plasma glucose is less than 5.6. So this is essentially a normal profile, and they've done this for at least one year without any medications. They're said to be in complete remission. And the final concept is prolonged remission, which is complete remission for at least five years. So it's just a longer duration rather than one year. This is a fairly new area and we don't know just yet how to predict who is likely to go into remission. We don't know what the outcomes are. What, what are the outcomes, for example, in patients where, who, who are not on pharmacotherapy? Are their outcomes the same as people who don't have diabetes? Uh, we just, we, we don't have information on this. And how often should we monitor patients who are off pharmacotherapy? Should we do it every six months, one year, three months? These are areas that we don't, uh, we don't know yet. So to summarize this, diabetes is associated with a high burden of morbidity and mortality. Diagnostic criteria right now, and there are limitations with this, but they're based on glucose and or hemoglobin A1C. There's a lot of active research to try and identify different biomarkers beyond glucose and A1C. The consensus report pulls together recommendations from the American guidelines as well as the European guidelines to address diagnosis and management of type 2 diabetes. Non-pharmacologic management is, is key to overall diabetes management, even if they're off pharmacotherapy. And this and pharmacologic management depends on a number of risk factors that the patient may have. Diabetes remission is possible, and we are gaining more information on predictors and outcomes in this population. So with that, I will stop. I'll stop sharing my screen. I'm happy to take questions or uh, have any other discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dugani, for that nice review of this important topic. We'll open it up for just a few minutes if you have any questions. Please feel free to either unmute or use the chat. While we're waiting to see if there are any questions, I just wanna let those of you that uh, joined a little bit late know that this entire presentation has been recorded and will be posted fairly soon on a new Africa Partners Medical YouTube training channel that we're developing so that you can go back and watch the entirety or review all this important information. It seems that you covered the material in such uh, great detail that no uh, clear questions coming right now. Uh, if something comes to mind, you can drop it in the chat. Otherwise, uh, we certainly can connect you to Dr. Dugani offline if something comes up. 
We appreciate the time that he took today uh, to present and all the time that goes into preparing such a, a, a thorough review of an important topic. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll move on to our next speaker who will be Dr. Jay Sheree Allen. And she's going to start sharing her slides and uh, introduce her topic to the group. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I guess good night or good evening. Um, are you able to hear me? Maybe Dr. Hami, you give me like a thumbs up or? Yes, we can hear you, thanks. Oh, perfect, perfect, all right. Thank you so much. And you're seeing my slides well, just the opening screen. I'm running a couple screens here, so I'm just making sure. Perfect, all right. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, Good night, everyone. Thank you for having me. I am uh, Jay Sheree Allen. Um, <clears throat> getting used to my other last name too, I come by saying. Uh, I am a, a family medicine physician, currently practicing at uh, the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Hami was one of my uh, teachers. He was my preceptor in my uh, pediatrics uh, rotation. So I'm so grateful um, to him and to the Africa Partners Medical Team for the invitation um, to speak to you on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. My husband will say I'm always talking about um, mental health because I think it is just so important. It's a critical topic, I think, very poorly understood and um, still a lot of stigma within our community. So I was born and raised in Jamaica, um, quite similar to your Ghanaian culture. Um, but I do consider Ghana my second home. I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. So I have uh, no disclosures. I have nothing to disclose. Um, today, we're going to have a conversation, and I'll keep it very brief, very um, kind of that 60-foot view um, of some mental health conditions and uh, the way this kind of relates to COVID-19. So we'll describe some of those symptoms, talk a little about prevalence, um, some factors that contribute to this, as well as I wanna get into a discussion on some successful strategies. So I think it is um, not surprising at all uh, to anyone um, in this room that um, there's been a significant um, impact on our mental health as a result of uh, this pandemic, right? So when we think of, you know, kind of those social economic um, impacts, we cannot um, leave out mental health when we talk about that. Yes, you know, a lot of us got anxious and it's normal, right? It's a part of the normal range of human emotions for us to be anxious or nervous or have some fear when something unknown happens. But, you know, when we're talking specifically about um, COVID-19, I think it sparked really some more serious health, health issues. You know, we're seeing the reports coming out now, data always lags, right? We're still in the pandemic as the first thing. It's not, this is not post-COVID, this is still COVID. Um, so we're getting some information now from 2020, um, maybe early 2021, but the data lags. Um, but it's important to know that this is certainly um, an issue that we need to look out for, not just with um, anxiety, which we've spoken, but post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, depression, um, and we've already started seeing some worrying trends with increased rates of suicidal thoughts and behaviors, um, especially too among healthcare workers, so I'm including us in this uh, conversation. The literature, as I said, is coming out there. Um, according to the WHO, 25% increase in uh, prevalence worldwide. Um, lots of studies coming out. Um, one that I, I really enjoyed reading too, um, specifically talking about um, a few African countries, including uh, Ghana. So this information is out there. So I have a question for you all, and you can just um, type your answer in the chat. So just do a yes, no, maybe so um, to the question in the chat. So in, um, in the past 10 months, so just this year, the year of 2022, in your practices, how many of you have either diagnosed or treated a patient with a mental health condition, specifically anxiety, depression, or post-traumatic stress disorder? So you can just put it in the chat, just like, yes, no, I haven't even considered that as a diagnosis. I wasn't even thinking about that. That's a perfectly legitimate answer too. 
Um, let me, I have so many things going, so let me open up. All right, so someone has said, yes, one patient. Someone saying, all right, it's impacted a lot of adolescents, children. I see some no's coming through, all right. So this is, I just wanted to kind of get a sense of kind of where we stand, because if we don't keep this in the differential, this is not something we're looking out for, right? It's not a diagnosis that we're going to, to make. So hopefully by the end of this talk, um, you know, you'll probably reflect on a couple patients you've seen and you're like, um, was there a diagnosis here that I probably um, could have added in addition to what I've seen before? So we'll jump into the first one. So this is commonly referred to as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is one of the anxiety disorders and triggered by, it could be direct or it could be indirect traumatic experiences. We're talking about exposure to death. I told you, we're gonna, I'm gonna include us as healthcare professionals in this conversation. And I mean, this is something we see, you know, not daily, depending on where you are in your practice or um, what specialty uh, you are in, but there is a lot of exposure uh, to death, but more so with this pandemic, um, there has been increased uh, exposure to death. There are some people who this is the most, um, whether it's illness or death they have seen, um, at one particular time. So it doesn't have to actually be death. It could also be the threat of death. And then also serious injury or um, sexual violation. But essentially what you go through or what your patient goes through causes them to feel this intense fear, um, this horror, this kind of sense of helplessness. And that is the issue. But it can't be a one day thing, right? So you can't have something that happened to you once and it affected you once and that's it. So um, this is quite a multidimensional issue, but the symptoms need to occur for more than one month and they must cause distress or impairment in either your social, your occupational or some other important area of uh, functioning. And what you'll see with some of these patients is now they'll start to avoid anything associated like with the trauma or they start to become unresponsive to some of these traumas. So, you know, they're avoiding like the thoughts and the feelings or conversations even around whatever that traumatic um, issue is. They're avoiding activities that remind them of that trauma as well. They're forgetting important details um, about it, start losing interest in things that remind them. Um, of that trauma, and then it becomes difficult for them to maintain and form healthy social relationships kind of moving forward, and it, it impacts their hope for the future. It really does a number um, on them, and so with this, though, we're finding that these traumatic um, event exposures can be grouped into like four sort of big categories, right? So intrusion avoidance, you know, the changes in the thoughts and the mood, um, changes in arousal and reactivity. So when I talk of intrusion, so let's start there. So some notes on that, right? It's the recurrence, the unwanted like memories just keep playing over and over, right? Almost like you're reliving or your patient is reliving the event as it were happening again. Sometimes we call that flashbacks, right? Um, having upsetting dreams or nightmares about this event or some severe emotional distress. Then when we talk about avoidance, you know, whether it's like talking about it, recalling um, the actual events or avoiding places and activities that remind um, people of these events. Then the negative mood uh, changes, right? So start kind of talking down, you know, becoming a little hopeless, um, you know, some memory sort of problems are getting in there. Um, I mentioned the difficulty maintaining relationships. Um, feeling detached, you know, from people who were once close to them, right? Their family, their friends, just um, having a hard time experiencing positive emotions. You know, you're like, how are you? Or uh, what's going on? Like, and it's, they always have something down, something down to say. And sometimes they describe their feeling as being numb. Like they just can't really feel what they're, they're going through, right? And then um, we talk about some of like the physical um, changes, um, you know, become like easily startled or frightened all the time. They're always on guard, right, for like danger or anger, sometimes picking up some self-destructive behaviors, 
um, you know, too much drinking or, you know, um, driving too fast, things that they know put them directly in harm's way. And of course, um, I joined the last talk when I think the speaker was talking about sleep becoming its own kind of category. It's not after you try everything else and then let's talk about sleep. Sleep is a big thing all on its own. Um, so in management of those disorders, but also um, with mental health uh, disorders. So very important um, signs to look to look out for, all right? Um, back to the chat, back to the chat. So now that we've uh, defined post-traumatic stress disorder a little, thinking and reflecting on a couple patients you've seen recently or even family members, could even be yourself, um, do any of those symptoms resonate? Do you feel like, mm, maybe I could have seen someone and I'm putting it all together now that, wow, I didn't call it PTSD, um, but maybe it could be. You could just put in the chat, maybe yes, no, whatever your thoughts are. I like, sometimes I don't like to know, see that I'm just like talking to like, a blank screen. You know, my slides are up. So I'm really just looking at like a screen. So it's nice to know that I'm interacting with everyone. So feel free to just put in a chat if you feel just from hearing from the symptoms of PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, if you feel like you've come across that in your practice um, at all. I see someone said they've suspected some depression. All right. So we're going to talk about two other um, um, topics. And so I'll circle back to the answers. So keep putting them in the chat. So in addition to PTSD, another big mental health uh, condition that has certainly um, been brought to the forefront um, before the pandemic, surely, but certainly now during the pandemic um, is generalized anxiety disorder, also referred to as just anxiety. Most people say anxiety. So this one is characterized by that excessive worry, right? This is like something bad is going to happen. That fear always like just these thoughts that just keep coming, coming, coming. The difficulty concentrating, like really irritable, just like getting, you know, like really restless, you know, um, thinking about like what's to come, what's to come. Like people with this really have these intrusive thoughts and these concerns. And they too might start to avoid some situations out of worry. You know, I don't drive on that street because I'm worried about something happening over there. Or, you know, I, I'm not going to do this because I'm afraid that I might not go to this place because I'm afraid that something might happen to me there. And these patients, honestly, you know, when the anxiety gets bad enough, can start to have physical symptoms, right? Some of the sweating, the trembling, the dizziness. They'll tell you that I feel like my heart is beating out of my chest, like my chest, I'm having some, some chest pains, you know? Um, so one thing I'd encourage you to do, you know, you need to do a cardiac workup. Please complete a full cardiac workup on your patients um, as you deem clinically appropriate when they come in for evaluation of chest discomfort. But uh, add this to your differential as well, especially when all the tests are coming back negative, right? Your ECG is negative, your labs are negative, your echo is perfectly normal. There's no history that supports an acute, um, you know, coronary events. Like, start to ask about anxiety. One of the tools that we use for that is um, the GAD7 or the GAD7. So, seven questions that's kind of um, help you to stratify where your patients um, kind of are. So there are some, um, I guess, uh, symptoms that we'll, we'll run through really quickly. So feeling restless, I told you, wound up on edge, easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating, being irritable is a big one. Um, you know, the headaches and the unexplained muscle aches and stomach aches. When you see patients like that, start if you've done your thorough, clinical workup, right? You've looked at the labs, you've done a full physical examination and you're like, what else is going on here? Um, please, please add this to your um, diagnosis, your potential uh, list of diagnosis. So your differential. All right, next big one. And keep putting in the chat if you've seen any of these in your uh, practice um, recently. So major depressive disorder this is a big one. 
Um, you know, this is also called depression. It just goes by the name depression. Also goes by clinical uh, depression. Um, this one is a serious um, mood disorder. So it's different from like usual, like mood fluctuations. Everybody has good days. Everybody has bad days, right? This is normal part of the range of human emotions. So don't um, pathologize like being human. <laughs> Um, but there comes a point where, you know, the emotional response to uh, some of these challenges um, has kind of uh, has tipped over, has kind of reached that tipping point. And that's when we need to start to think about um, this as a more serious health condition. According to the WHO, um, depression is actually now the leading cause of disability worldwide. So this is very, very, very serious. And it ranges. It's on a spectrum. There are people who are completely functional and still able to show up to work every day, show up in their personal lives, care for their families, put on a smile and do what they need to do, but are still struggling and right going all the way to, you know, um, the heart attack per se or, you know, that um, event we wish to prevent. Um, on that spectrum of uh, depression, you know, now we're talking about suicide. It's now the leading, uh, the fourth leading cause of death of individuals 15 to 29 years of age. So we have a serious problem on our hands here. Um, symptoms and what they look like. Depressed mood most of the day or nearly every, every day. It's just, it's not a one-time thing, right? You're not sad today. And or your patient isn't sad today and they're okay tomorrow. This this really sticks around, hangs around for um, some time. And I'll talk a little more specifically too, right? So also looking at like diminished interest or pleasure in things that they love to do, right? So like I used to like going out with my friends and doing X, Y, Z. And now I just can't even get myself to be motivated enough to get out the bed to go and do these things. Uh, looking at some of their eating patterns, sometimes you see some significant um, appetite increase or decrease. This is a big one. Um, a slowing down of their thoughts and kind of like a reduction in their physical like movements. Um, this is also another one. And this is how as, you know, friends or colleagues, as physicians, you can also help out your um, patients and even your family members, right? When sometimes when people are really in the thick of things, you know, mentally they're not well, they are not um, the best person to identify that they're not doing okay. So that's why it's important to surround yourself with a good community of people who can help you to pick up on some of these things. The fatigue and the energy, they'll say like, you know, I don't even know if this is worth it anymore is one of those things that um, you'll, you'll hear, you know, those like passive, not well sort of thoughts. And then the um, issues just with concentration, decisiveness, and um, recurrent thoughts, again, of not being here. And it's important to kind of put that into context because, you know, sometimes we are even afraid to ask people because we don't want to hear the answer. We don't want to hear what they have to say. Um, but it's, you don't cause people to become suicidal by asking them if they are having thoughts of ending their life, right? So if someone needs someone to reach out to, they need to talk, it's important to ask um, about that. You don't cause someone to end their life by mentioning it to them, right? So the one thing I wanted to um, stress here though, to make that diagnosis, someone needs to be experiencing five or more of these symptoms during the same two week uh, period. And the first and the second one, one of those have to be a yes, right? One of those have to be present. And there's also a screening tool for this one um, and that's the PHQ-9, so the patient health questionnaire and uh, nine questions. Um, we're also kind of um, reviewing some other features of depressive disorder. So with mixed features, so patients who are, they don't have bipolar disorder um, and maybe yourself or a colleague they don't have bipolar disorder, but they do have the presence of some sometimes um, manic symptoms or those highs um, or anxiety that's also um, along with this. So needless to say, um, 
these are conditions that kind of run into each other. And sometimes it can be difficult to tease um, the diagnosis apart. I'm sorry, Dr. Hami, can you give me a time check in uh, the chat, please? Sorry, as <laughs> I keep going. Um, so it's important to kind of look out for these things, especially if you feel like you are diagnosing one, figuring out if another is, um, is in the works as well. So prevalence. I was trying to get you some good numbers, um, but as you can imagine, the numbers are all over um, the place. So... Um, the WHO um, is approximating that approximately 13-ish percent. And let me know your thoughts on that too um, in the chat. 13% of the population in Ghana is suffering from a mental health disorder. 3% severe. So you're talking patients who need inpatient psychiatric care, need to go to like one of, you know, your five like psychiatric centers. That's that 3%. But the 10%, so the bigger, and I believe these numbers are underreported, um, to be quite frank, but um, that bigger population, right? So these are people who are still functional, still able to go to work every day, still able to care for their families, right? Um, this is a larger subset of the population. And what I've come to, to find, you know, sometimes you have to look for um, the, the, the language um, that patients come to you with because nobody comes and says, oh, I'm depressed, or maybe they do, but very few people come and say, I'm depressed. It's, oh, doc, I have stress. <laughs> I was stressed. And so one of the articles, um, the one I'm uh, citing here, I think did a phenomenal job of um, not just looking for the word depression or the word anxiety, but the way in which we categorize those um, events. So, you know, and this is pulling da uh, data from those three, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, um, in that study I referenced before, but what people refer to as like the stress. Um, so financial problems, death of a loved one, too much, too little work, goes along with unemployment, um, illness of a loved one, time-related um, pressures and family conflict uh, really impacted the state of their well-being, the way they're able to show up in the world and function. Again, don't call it depression. We don't call it anxiety. We don't call it PTSD. Um, but they might refer to, hey, these problems in my family. Uh, this is what it's doing to me, right? In addition to the stress, trauma, right? Physical assault, motor vehicle accidents, accidents, at work or at home, unwanted sexual experiences, illnesses or Ill, um, injuries that are life-threatening, and of course, uh, natural uh, disasters. Um, in this study, we found that um, Ghana is one of the countries that are ranked um, quite high on the list of countries that have had um, exposure to at least one of these traumatic events. And I think it's important to put this into context, you know, um, if we're trying to have a frank conversation about this, we have to use the language um, that um, our patients are expressing the issues they're going through. And these are some of the highest um, rates in the world, right? Looking at places like Ukraine, the United States, Colombia, some pretty um, high numbers. We gotta talk to people like Germany and stuff, their numbers are low. Um, this picture, I think, is um, of no, I, everyone is intimately familiar um, with this here, but one of the biggest traumatic events, um, and we're not calling it as such, but it is, it absolutely is, um, was the biggest global crisis we faced in our generation, and that is the COVID-19 pandemic. I think, you know, this has had severe and far-reaching um, repercussions for us as individuals, um, for economies, um, for societies, right? Countless people have died. Um, people who didn't die left behind people who are depending on them, um, who are struggling at this point. Families and communities have been strained. Children have missed out on learning and their socialization, still figuring out how, what kind of impact that is gonna have on them. I call it Zoom school. Um, you know, just we, we I think we totally underestimated the importance of being in a fellowship with our fellow humans, um, you know, but businesses that have gone bankrupt, right? Millions of people worldwide have now fallen below the poverty line in their respective countries as a result of uh, this pandemic. So we've had some significant uh, challenges here. And I've also... 
oops, sorry, went to the end of my slides. Um, so also um, the story, the half has yet to be told, um, to be quite frank. As I said, we're still in the midst of the pandemic and data lags, right? So we're still waiting to hear what the true impact on our mental health is gonna be after this is all done. But I think there are some good things in the works. Um, from my um, research and feel free to correct me, please, you are on the ground in Ghana. I spend a lot of time in Ghana, but you are there now. Um, so I understand just 2.97, um, so almost around 3% of your total health budget is allocated to mental health. I mean, there's room for improvement um, there, especially as we're talking about the fact that the half is yet to be told in regards to um, the impact of uh, this pandemic. You know, but one of the strategies um, that I think is on the rise or on the way, you know, we typically think of patients with mental health conditions needing to go into a psychiatric facility where they're going to a cross psychiatric or whatever, wherever it is, right? Thinking that we need to send them to like a psychiatric hospital. But there is increasing evidence to support what we now call collaborative care or integrated behavioral health, which is addressing the primary care needs or the mental health needs of our patients in the primary care setting or in the regular space where they come to see you. So whether that's OPD or, um, you know, whether they see you in an antenatal clinic or, you know, they're in uh, the accident center, wherever it is, um, addressing some of their mental health needs there. Because as I said, we're talking about this bigger 10%. These are not individuals or patients, colleagues or yourselves who need to be in a cross psychiatry, right? You can be addressed by the physician caring uh, for you. Um, my mentor, uh, Dr. Kurt Engsman, happens to um, concentrate his research in this area. And so there are lots of articles out there that um, provide um, information on how to kind of establish or get these collaborative care practices going forward. And I think this is one of the ways to reduce stigma and therefore increase our patients um, comfort in seeking help because they don't need to go to X place um, to go and talk about the stress and the trauma impacting them. They can go to their usual doctor and they can bring um, this up as well. You know, I'm family medicine. So as a primary care doctor, I think this is near and dear to my heart. Some treatment options that are um, available. Again, I said in my disclosure, I'm not, um, I have no pharma school disclosures at all. So we're not going to touch into any details of any medicine. That's a conversation for another day, but there are um, options available. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is the first and foremost, number one. I do understand that it is an act of God to find a therapist, um, but I promise you, if you can, it's worth it. Absolutely worth it. Um, and then there are medications, right? So we're talking about SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. That's your, um, you know, sertraline, fluoxetine, like meds that we can have another conversation um, about. And some of the oldies but goodies, you know, the tricyclic antidepressants, those are your like um, amitriptyline or triptylines, um, very good evidence um, for uh, depression, anxiety. Um, I wanted to, and I'm, my, I'm winding down on time, but I um, <clears throat> cannot express to you the amount of people who have come to me and asked me, and they're like, so Jay Sheree, what is like, what exactly is therapy? What is this therapy thing? Why does this therapy thing mean anything? I think my husband's probably laughing at me right now because he said, I just I live on a hill to talk about therapy. Um, so I wanted to give you that. I, that's the only treatment option I wanted to get into a little bit of detail about because you, I want us to understand why um, this is impactful, why it makes a difference, and therefore why it actually is uh, recommended as first-line treatment for mild to moderate um, depression and anxiety. So psychological part problems, right? We talked about the stress. We talked about the traumas. Um, that kind of, you know, help to facilitate some of those issues, but they are in part, you know, when they become pathologic, right? So not, I'm sad today, I'm okay tomorrow, or I'm anxious today, I'm okay tomorrow. I'm not talking about that. It's so when we tip over to edge into, we're talking about pathology now, right? Um, these problems now are based in part on like a faulty way or an unhelpful way of thinking about 
the problem, the stress, the trauma that you have gone through. And then there are patterns of behaviors um, that we have. We have ways we go about things. Like there are just ways we do things. Some of them are avoided. Um, but there are ways we go about things. And so these are um, sometimes not helpful, right? So in therapy, you can learn better ways of coping with some of these issues and therefore better ways of being able to address some of the symptoms that you are uh, or your patient um, is essentially going through, right? So the issue is not the stress. It's the issue is not the trauma. The issue is that compounded with the unhelpful ways that we think about what we're going through and some of these unhelpful patterns of behavior that we have learned through our course of our lives, right? And some of them are important. They're survival um, tactics, right? But are they helpful as you move into this XYZ new chapter of your life, right? So specifically, it can help you to recognize the distortion in your thinking that is creating or exacerbating um, the problems you're having and help you to reevaluate them in light of your current circumstances. So whether it's a situation that, you know, a parent didn't treat you a certain way at a certain point in time, and the impact of that is now manifesting in the way that you manage your family or your patients are managing their family and reliving that trauma, that is like distorted thinking that therapy, being able to really elaborate on some of that can help you to kind of shift your mindset in what you're going through. So it's not undermining the trauma, not undermining the stress, but shifting the way you think about it. Also to help you gain a better understanding of the behavior pattern and the motivation, help you with some problem solving skills to cope in these situations, and then ultimately develop a greater sense of confidence in your own ability to navigate this difficult um, situation, all right? So when somebody asks you like, what is therapy? Why does therapy make sense? Like, you know, I'm not gonna pay to sit and talk to somebody um, because you're gonna follow up on all the literature says, first line treatment for mild to moderate um, depression and anxiety is um, therapy, right? You get into medications um, when we get a little later along in the disease process. So I think it's important for us as, clinicians, and I'm talking to all of us here are in the medical field, um, to be able to explain to our patients why a treatment option works. But again, I say that with the caveat that finding a therapist, um, specifically a good therapist, um, is an act of God. I recognize that. Definitely a field that needs um, more practitioners. Um, so I'll close um, with a quote that I love um, in um, quite a bit of um, the literature I reviewed in putting this talk together. So some was scientific, some were um, personal. I really liked uh, this one. So when more people understand the importance of protecting the mental well-being of the population, you'll start to demand policy changes to ensure it. This is not telling somebody to get over it you know, you're, be strong um, and pray. Pray is important. You need to pray. You can pray and go to therapy. You can trust God and go to therapy at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive, right? But transparency, and this is when we talk about stigma, um, about mental illness will become a norm and will gradually render fear and this labeling obsolete. We have to clear the path for people to be able to openly and honestly speak about their feelings and how the stress and the trauma in their life is impacting that, including this pandemic, right? It's important. And when I say policy, you know, we're talking of things like schools providing psychological counseling, right? Religious leaders considering devoting time to improving the emotional and mental well being of their members. And again, us as medical and health professionals, placing an emphasis on this, right? You won't make the diagnosis that you don't think about. And so it's important that you add this kind of to your, your differential as you're going through, you know, patients kind of going through the list of issues they have. Um, so with that being said, you know, I told you guys Ghana is my second home, spent quite a bit of my earlier years in medicine um, there. This is me in Apam, uh, which I absolutely loved my time there. I spent a couple of weeks there. Um, worked at Corley Boo for a little bit. Um, even gave, um, I was in the residency, uh, the family medicine residency program over there with my mentor, Dr. Roberta Lamptey. Um, but of course, Ghana led me to 
meeting um, the most incredible human I have ever had the opportunity um, to meet. And now I get to share life with him, Dr. Joseph Akambase. Uh, so thank you all um, so much for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, here are my references. Um, and I am willing to answer some uh, questions. I think I am at time, 2.20, Dr. Hami. I'll stop sharing. Very well done, very precise. So thank you for sharing such an important topic with our group today. And we'll open it up for a few minutes for questions for Dr. J. Sheree Allen. So and you could put them in the chat too, if you, you um, don't wanna say it out or anything. I'm totally fine reading from, uh, you can send it privately, a direct. Oh Lord, guys, don't leave me hanging, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm totally fine answering any questions. I'm also fine sharing um, my slides to Dr. Hami with the um, kind of the symptoms written out and diagnostic criteria and that sort of thing too. I'm totally fine doing that. Thank you for that. I, I'll actually have a question for you. You mentioned yeah. the focus of this was both for our patients, but also for ourselves and our colleagues. You know, I think most of us as clinicians aren't trained in some of the important nuances of therapy, but how can we as peers support each other uh, when it comes to this issue? Any suggestions? Absolutely, no, this is a very, very good question. Um, you know, I think the most important thing we can do for our peers and our colleagues is to create space um, for them to speak up about the challenges that they are experiencing. You know, if we don't ask, people will never tell, right? So if you notice that a colleague has some of these symptoms that I described or I mentioned before, they used to come to work and they were the life of the party, right? They were excited to be there. They were the ones, you know, the biggest cheerleader in the office or the clinic. And you notice like now they've become, they're kind of withdrawing, um, you know, kind of coming into themselves. They show up, they just kind of do their work and they just go, you know? Ask them, like, are you okay? Like, what is going on? It's okay. Like, you can let me know. Like, is something happening? Is there some stress in your life that, you know, what is it? But I think we have to create the space um, for uh, people to be feel free or to feel like they have permission um, to speak. Definitely respect their privacy and offer confidentiality if someone does trust you enough to open up and um to speak, you know, definitely don't breach um, breach that trust. I think it's important. And then um, my second, I'll just share these two, um, is sharing your own experience. You know, I go to therapy. I personally don't understand how people navigate life without going to therapy. It has been probably one of the most transformative things I've done um, for myself. And so you don't need to be at the point where you need admission to a psychiatry like hospital to need to talk to someone or to benefit um, from um, cognitive behavioral therapy. So feel free and feel open to share your experiences and what you've been through. You liberate others with your own story. Thank you, that is very helpful. That's valuable advice. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I thank you so much and uh, good night to everyone else. I hope you enjoy the uh, rest of your lectures tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. We appreciate your time and the effort you put into this and your willingness uh, to meet with everyone today. For our final speaker today, I welcome Terry Riffle. She's a nurse. She's been a longtime participant with Africa Partners Medical. She's made trips to Ghana to be part of our young doctors and nurses training. And one of the themes of Africa Partners Medical really is trying to prevent needless death and suffering. And in that we teach about specific medical topics such as management, uh, diagnosis and management of diabetes like you heard today. We other topics such as the um, effects, mental health effects of COVID-19. But a lot of our training also focuses on how we think about and how we interact with the roles and responsibilities with our patients and with each other. And Terry, as a nurse, is gonna share some important information about patient-centered care and compassionate care, on how this applies to physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers. So thank you, Terry, for speaking with us today.
Hi, everybody. I had a little computer problems in the beginning here, so just making sure this shows for everybody. Looks great to us. Okay, are you on the presenter screen or I've got I've got a double screen, so I want to make sure I got the right yes, one up. Switch, switch back to what you had before. We're not okay. Before. All right, right one now. Perfect. All righty. So um just talk a little bit about patient-centered care, kind of the history and compassionate care. So, you know, applicable, this is applicable to nursing as well as providers. Um, just to go over a little bit of the historical model of patient care, it tended to be very disease-oriented, provider-centered. The care was organized around the needs and desires of healthcare professionals instead of the patient. The, the passive patient, not involved in the care decision-making, things were done to them, not with them as part of the team. They were not included in the care team. And care and outcomes were not always congruent with patient preferences, they weren't taken into consideration. And in fact, the patient was often seen as like a captive customer. The history of non-patient-centered care, um, of course, many, many years ago, care and compassion were basically the only treatment or the majority of the treatment that could be provided like in historical medicine. But over time, as medical sciences provided new options that improved outcomes, they distanced the physicians from their patients. So very disease-oriented, very intervention-oriented, not always including the patient. It resulted in a healthcare environment in which patients were excluded from care planning and decision-making. So in 1988, the term patient-centered care was coined. The goal was to call attention to the need for healthcare to shift the focus away from disease and back to the family and the patient. The term was meant to stress the importance of understanding the experience of illness and addressing patients' needs, so that, which was even more important now with increasingly complex and fragmented healthcare system, this became even more important. So two definitions, the Institute of Medicine defines patient-centered care as providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions while the World Health Organization defines patient-centered care as empowering people to take charge of their own health rather than being passive recipients of the services. So as we're going through this, I just kind of like you to think of examples or how you feel where you're working um, works with this. Is it patient-centered? Is it provider-centered? Is it facility-centered? And maybe share that at the end. So some of the principles of patient-centered care, and, and there are many, but we'll just kind of go through some of them. Um, it's, it's complex. It's seen as a multi-dimensional concept with the patient at the center of healthcare delivery. So instead of the provider, instead of the facility, instead of the treatment at the center, the patient is at the center. Personal values of each patient are at the base of all patient-related therapeutic decisions. Um, we can talk about this a little bit more, but thinking about what is the patient wanting what are their values? Is this you know, something we're trying to do, go against something that they believe or you know, just looking at the whole patient and, and what's of value to them? The healthcare system's mission, vision, values, leadership and quality improvement drivers are aligned to patient-centered goals. So uh, you know, often we think of our goals as healthcare providers, we want this patient to do this and we want this outcome. What is the patient's goal? What do they want? Care is collaborative, coordinated, integrated, and accessible. I know accessible is a big issue in a lot of the articles. That's a huge thing, access. Um, so it's one of the things to work on. The right care is provided at the right time in the right place. So sometimes what we think is the right time in the right place may not be what the patient thinks. And we need to take that into consideration. Care focuses on physical comfort, pain management, as well as emotional well-being like alleviation of fears and anxieties. Kind of what we we're just talking about too, how much that plays into it, fear, anxiety, and depression all have to be taken into account even for the medical conditions. Respect for patient and family preferences needs values, cultural traditions, and so socioeconomic conditions. So patients and their families are expected part of the care team. So not just an option, but they're expected to be part of the care team and play a role in the decisions at the patient system, at the, at the patient and system level. So instead of just kind of 
hoping they get involved, they're expected to be involved in that team. And the presence of family members in the care setting is encouraged and facilitated. So those who have been around for a long time in healthcare, like I have, I remember the days of very limited visiting hours in hospitals. Um, family members were almost looked at sometimes as an intrusion into what we wanted to get done for the patient and like, just hurry up and leave, we need to do this. You know, this is a totally different look of patients being in, encouraged to have family members involved in their care and visiting and inpatient coming with them into um, ambulatory settings um, instead of being looked at as something that was like a problem. Infor information is shared fully and in a timely manner so that patients and their family members can make informed decisions. Again, um, information sharing so that they're part of the team in that decision making. It isn't just the provider in the healthcare system making the decisions for them and telling them what's best for them. So this was just one model, there were many, but um, I won't read through the whole thing for you, but there's a, one of the models of patient-centered care. So you can kind of see patient in the center, obviously for patient-centered care and the aspects around there um, that we've already partly talked about. So that given what things are not patient-centered care. So giving patients whatever they ask for or want you might think, well, yeah, that's patient-centered care. If we're looking at what the patient wants, and then we should be giving them what they ask for. Well, not necessarily. What patients want is not always what they need. And a happy patient with an appropriate care is not patient-centered care. The one example I think of this, I work in a family medicine um, at Mayo in Arizona, and we get a lot of patients, you know, have a cold for a couple of days and they want antibiotics and they push and push and push for antibiotics. We know that's not the best care for them. So we're not giving them what they ask for but we're explaining it and giving them information and giving them the best thing for them. Is it at odds with evidence-based practice? No, good outcomes must be defined by what is meaningful and valuable to individual patients. So you're still, you're not throwing away evidence-based practice, but you're working on that along with being patient-centered. And then some people, you might've been in hospitals or facilities in different places where it's more like a boutique hotel, greeters, greenery, gadgetry, all these things. And although that might enhance their experience, that doesn't necessarily achieve goals of patient-centered care. So how do we put this into practice? So respecting patients as unique beings, using their name, you know, personal information, not you know, like the, the example here, not the liver transplant in room 302. And I've heard that many, many times, you know, oh, the, you know the heart attack in whatever room. These are you know, individual patients. We should be using their names and thinking of them as individual patients, not as diseases or diagnoses. Providing empathy and compassion and physical comfort. So pain management, assistance with daily needs. A lot of people, if you can't go anywhere, if they're in pain and their daily needs are not, needs are not met, then you can't move forward. Respecting patient preferences, needs, and values. Uh, especially in, in multicultural settings. You know, there may be um, some interventions that we think would be appropriate for that patient, but they go against their cultural or religious values, and um, you're going to have conflict there, and it's not going to work well. So we need to know those things and, and investigate what their preferences, values, needs, cultural, religious um, kind of things that they have to deal with before we decide everything. Of course, we need to honor those preferences, but don't mindlessly enact them. There has to be mutual consent. Again, I can think of an example when I worked at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles on the oncology floor, um, and we had a certain religion that wouldn't do um, blood transfusions, but we had a, a child with severe new onset leukemia that desperately needed a blood transfusion, and we really had to work with that, respecting their religious beliefs, but really trying to explain how it was like a life or death matter. So that can be something that any other patient, you know, different religion, different cultural aspect, they would not have even thought twice about that. But um, with, that, with that family, we really had to, had to think about that and work with them on that. So you can care for the patients on their terms. Again, it's gotta be mutual, but um, you know, I think of it even as nursing in the hospital and stuff. It, not always on our time frame. sometimes on their time frame. Yes, things have to be done in time, 
but you know, is the patient sleeping? Can you give them 15 more minutes, you know, 30 more minutes before you go in and wake them up to do an intervention? Um, change from a physician seeing themselves as the authority to as a partnership with that patient and their family. Tailor information and education to patients' needs and health literacy, sometimes using teach back and open-ended open questions. So not necessarily the kind of um, after discussion, do you understand, but um, can you tell me in your words what I explained to you and your understanding of this? So those very open-ended questions, often a patient, if they're just asked, do you have any questions or do you understand? No, no questions. Yes, I understand. If you ask those open-ended questions and ask for teach back, you'll find out where those needs are, uh, where the gaps are. Involve patients and families in care, invite patients to participate. So, you know, there again, it, including the patient in that care team, in the discussions, in the um, deciding of care, they need to be part of that. And providing continuity of care. So discharge planning, access to social services, follow-up care, it's that total patient care management kind of view there, where you're looking at the total picture. So what are some of the outcomes of true patient-centered care? Improved individual outcomes. When, when patients are involved, they usually recover more quickly, they're more satisfied, they're happier, they just have an all, all around better outcome. They feel understood, they're developing a trusted, trusting relationship with their providers and their care team. They're more motivated to change and do the things that have been recommended for them. And there's better communication between the patients and their caregivers when they're included in as the family, as part of the care team, and just overall improved quality of care, which has been proven in um, surveys, hospital surveys. Um, patients become more increased, patients increase involvement in their own care, which is again, better outcomes and better, better adherence to their treatment plans and self-care. You know, if you've had patients and it, I see it here in the clinic setting, new diagnosis of something like diabetes, and if it's just all told them, here's what you have to do, here's what you have to do, here's what you have to do, they don't always adhere to that. It's just overwhelming when they're pulled in and included in the treatment plan, um, help, it helps them become more involved in their care. And um, they, wanna, they wanna be involved and they wanna complete their goals. And overall, um, patient-centered care shows definite increase in patient satisfaction in the scores where hospitals and clinics do patient satisfaction scores, they've increased a lot. Um, so it's not just random episodes here and there of care, it's a continuum of care. So different disciplines, different episodes of care all become one big continuum of care. Knowledge and information are freely shared between patients, their care partners, and even approved third parties. So a lot of that is more, you know, the open access to the different, um, different disciplines and all to make their care more unif uniform. So patients are more likely to return, um, improved preventive care. So, you know, a lot of these things, the preventive care is, is as important as treating the diseases and the concerns at the time, but that preventive care, if they're, if they're included in the team, they're more likely to keep up that preventive care. And again, improved overall patient satisfaction score, scores and even improved staff morale, morale and productivity. So if you have you know, patients that are compliant and are included and it's a team approach, um, that helps overall with staff too. And improved resource allocation, decreased expenses. So it's been proven that engaged patients are much healthier and incur fewer costs than non-engaged patients. And I'm, I'm sure we could talk about a lot of examples of that, um, but a patient that's not engaged and not following their care plan and included in their care often end up with more and more complications that become more and more costly. So some examples of patient-centered care in action, um, family members being invited to, to a visit, to visit during appointments, hospital rounding, shift changes, so they can be part of that care team. They can participate in discussions, they can help in the care decision making instead of being asked to step out or wait in a waiting room. And, and I know I've seen that. Um, I've done a lot of international travel and also, you know, years ago where 
you know, like when the physician's going to speak with the patient, asking the family members to step out, or when nursing is doing a certain care, asking the family members to step out. It's fine to ask the patient if they're comfortable and would like the family member in there, and, and if they're not for, for some sort of a care, that's fine, but if that patient wants that family member in there, they should be included as part of that team. And just even things like customized medications and therapies based on um, patients' individual genetics, metabolism, biomarkers, immune system, and other signatures like the pharma, um, pharmacogenomics tests instead of just standard treatment. And I know, you know, here at Mayo, we've been doing a lot of those, the, the cheek swab and the whole rundown of the um, genomics testing to see if patients are on the correct medications. So where does nursing come in? So that was all more provider-centered and, and patient-centered care is usually typically addressed more to providers, but nursing can also implement patient-centered care. They have um, crucial influence on the patient care experience, their satisfaction and perception of being in the center of the care and included in the care. So what are some ways involving the patients and family and nursing bedside reports? This has been proven over and over to reduce errors and improve communication. There again, if the if the patient and family are involved, you know, sometimes nursing or providers may say something and it's like, no, that's not right. That's not how that happened. Where if the nurses and the providers are off separately away from the patient and the family, you know, that correction may not be there. Um, obviously nursing and providers have a lot of patients and it would be easily easy to just maybe make a mix up. If you get that patient and the family in there, you're gonna be much more accurate and reduce errors. Nursing, as well as providers, these both apply to both, can identify the unique needs of each patient. So, you know, there again with the, some of the examples I already talked about, um, you know, one patient may have a unique need that another one may not have. Maybe even just something as simple as knowing the patient's hard of hearing. So making sure during rounds um, that, that the providers involved are speaking loudly enough that the patient hears or that the family member that's hard of hearing hears. Um, just, you know, being cognizant of those things, listening to patients and help practicing shared decision making again, not only with um, treatment decisions, but even just in care, like, or, you know, is this a good time to do something? Again, I understand we can't always meet just their exact schedule needs, but, you know, giving them some choices and utilizing advanced communication skills. I know there's a lot of different classes. Um, we have at Mayo and different kinds of classes that are just out there on the internet for advancing your communication skills that can be really helpful. Um, involving patients in nursing assessments, again, making sure you're not just deciding what's going on, but you know, involving them in what you're assessing. And empathy and compassion, that's of course something we should all as healthcare providers be providing to patients. So compassion is a fundament, fundamental element in nursing practice and in education. Compassionate care definitions, there are many. There's never been a consensus as to one definition that defines compassionate care, but it is a value, an emotion, um, which can be contextually and culturally specific. It often is used interchangeably with other terms such as caring, sympathy, empathy, thoughtfulness, kindness, understanding patient needs. So all those are part of compassionate care even though there's not one standard definition of that compassionate care. So what are some of the elements of compassionate care? Listening to patients and families and acknowledging their feelings. So not only just answering questions, but acknowledging their feelings. Um, I just had a patient yesterday that we were having a lot of difficulty getting some advanced imaging for their mammogram because there'd been an abnormal on their initial mammogram and, and she was very anxious and I just needed to acknowledge that to understand this is taking a while for a lot of different reasons, um, but I know you feel really anxious and she just appreciated that I had not acknowledged that she was very anxious. Caring actions to provide support are the art and essence of nursing. Developing a connection or relationship with patients from one shift to many years even. You have patients that you see over and over and over if you're developing that relationship with the patients, that really helps their overall care. Um, I, again, just an example, I see this in the Medicare patient visits I do year after year after year with the same patients, and we've developed a strong relationship, and, and they feel they can, you know, they can trust you once you've developed that relationship. 
you, you develop that trust and rapport. And definitely showing them that you're striving to alleviate their suffering, whether pharmacologically or non-pharmacologically. Um, if they're in pain, it's gonna be hard for them to listen. It's gonna be hard for them to do anything else, alleviating or to the best of our ability that pain and suffering will help them move on to the next stage. And supporting family mem members, even during challenging patient situations. So there are times, um, you know, the patient may not even be alert, awake, but family members are under a lot of stress, have a lot of concerns and acknowledging those and addressing those, including that patient family member. So pro even providing touch, holding a hand, placing a hand on a patient's arm or shoulder, we can all do that just as a way of showing that we're giving them our time, giving them um, personal care, good eye contact, giving care with dignity. There again, there's so many ways to do that. Just, um, you know, just modesty and protecting their privacy, being very careful if they're doing that. You know, patient has in the hospital in their bed with maybe a, an abdominal dressing or something that needs to be looked at. Just being very careful, you just don't go in and throw the covers back and expose them. Like very good care in, in keeping them um, with their dignity and, and privacy and spending enough time with patients to meet their needs. So, you know, not just talking to them and then on the way out, you're like heading to the door before you even finish. So they just feel like, oh, they need to go. They don't have time for me. I don't wanna ask any questions. You know, take that time to ask if there are any concerns using those, you know, open-ended teach back means and, and don't look like you're rushing out or don't have time for them. Even if it's true that you're very busy, show them that you care and are giving them their time. And just going beyond the role of the nurse or even the physician. Um, again, to use an example um, at Mayo, and I know those in Ghana wouldn't see these, but on our internet side, a lot of times they discuss different ways that um, care providers, nurses, physicians, and all have gone above and beyond to do things like, um, you know, a, a dying patient in the hospital, but helping them with, some have even gotten married in the hospital, even though they're very critical, they're, you know, desiring for that. They've held those, those kind of things right in the hospital, an anniversary, a birthday, some sort of special thing where you know the nurses or the physicians involved are going above and beyond what would be expected as a normal part of their job in nursing care to meet the patient's needs and to um, just show their care and, and to look at that big picture of what really makes the patient feel comfortable and what their needs are. So that's just some examples of how we can do that. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to unmute and share a question, comment, or even an example of how you have seen patient-centered and compassionate care in action or where you see it maybe lacking. If you have a question, feel free to unmute and say that or a comment, examples. I can think of lots of them, but I don't want to always share mine. So if anybody has any, I'd love to hear them. If not, do you have any questions? Feel free to unmute and ask them or throw them in the chat and I'm happy to share the slides. Well, Terry, I want to thank you for covering this important a topic. It's the, um, it looks like there's a, a question coming here, but I do want to say that sometimes in healthcare, we feel like we need a lot of special training to take good care of patients. That's not what this is. This is something that can be implemented by everyone every day. It doesn't take a lot of special training, but it does take a little time and it takes a little attention and it takes uh, sometimes a shift in attitude to make sure that we're providing the type of care that you mentioned today. And there's often like, what's in it for us? Well, you covered very clearly improvement in outcomes. And that's ultimately, I think, as healthcare providers that we want to see as good outcomes for the patients that we're serving. In the chat, there's a question about what's the difference between patient-centered care and family-centered care? Do you want to share your thoughts on that? Um, 
from what I'm, what, a lot of the articles I read, basically patient-centered care and family-centered care are the same. You, in patient-centered care, you know, one of the um, elements of that is including the family. So it's it's still focusing on the patient, but with the inclusion of the family, I, I don't really see that those were differentiated as two different things. I don't know if that answers the question or if somebody, if, if you see it a different way or have another question about that or um, have a comment about that, feel free to jump in. Well, I'll comment uh, from the perspective of a pediatrician where my patients almost always have family members with them. In this past week working in the hospital, you know, most of the time as we go around seeing the patients, the goal was to include family members to the degree that they're interested in being part of the process, both giving information and as you gave examples of uh, clarifying where there's questions or not. Sometimes, you know, oftentimes the words that we use make a big difference. And I talked to my team about when we walk in the room and we tell patients and families, the plan is, well, what if they don't like the plan? Then it sort of feels like we're at odds with each other. So I try to remember to use words like our recommendations are, and giving reasons why are those, so it feels a little bit more collaborative, but having the patient and the family involved in both us giving them information, but getting valuable information from them as we come to a decision together. I did see a hand up. I don't know if someone had a question they wanted to ask. Feel free to unmute yourself. I just wanted to say too, I work with one of our um, providers who, I've heard her many times, I mean, she'll say this to nursing as far as things too, but she'll say to families, she'll kind of do the, you know, here's what I'm thinking, you know, and she always ends up with, what do you think? What, you know, what do you think? Will this work? What, what are your thoughts? So she always includes the patient and family here with, you know, I want to know what you think and, and is this going to work for you? Can you do this? And I appreciate that. I see patients love her. They, they really appreciate that part of it. Um, the other thing I think is that we've probably seen this as far as um, COVID when they wouldn't allow the fam you know, as many family members in or, or for a while there, I think any family members in the hospital, that was really, really hard for patients. So I think we can see that effect um, kind of as the previous presentation that made a big effect on, on patients in the hospital. I don't work inpatient, but I heard a lot of that was very hard on patients when they couldn't have their family members right there with them. I want to mention a comment that was made at one of our in-person training sessions a few years ago, and it's real. We had some young physicians mention that if they try involving patients in the decision-making, if they ask them for their opinion, sometimes the response they would get was, well, don't you know what you're doing? Why don't you get me a doctor or a nurse that knows what they're doing instead of asking me what I want to do? So it can be challenging. Sometimes it, we can come across as maybe being uncertain of ourselves. But I think if we share this information in the context of, I have recommendations for you, but I also know that patients do better if they're allowed to share their thoughts. Would you, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share with me? Um, so instead of setting up a situation where Again, it, culturally, sometimes it feels like if they don't just tell me what to do, it means they're unsure. Or, But we know that over time, really, if we can get people involved in their healthcare decisions, they tend to do much better. Right. And I think that, you know, putting forth your plan of care of what you're thinking and recommendation, but then asking their input or if they think that's something that they can do um, maybe helps with that. Yeah, nobody else has anything. I appreciate your time and I hope you find it helpful in your practice. Well, I want to say thank you to all three of our speakers today for presenting uh, their topics. There's a lot that can be covered for all of these things, but I feel like they did a really nice job uh, summarizing. There's it's always opportunities to go deeper. If you want to connect with us in any way, don't hesitate to reach out uh, through emails. As I mentioned earlier, and those of you who joined us later, this 
presentation will be uploaded to a new YouTube channel, Africa Partners Medical Training YouTube channel. We have one video on there from a virtual training session last year. So if you want more information, you can go watch that. This will be uploaded. You'll be able to leave some comments. And certainly we'd love to hear from you about future topics. Our next scheduled virtual training is Saturday, December 3rd. We'll do a similar format, about two hours and three different presentations, three different presenters. We are here to try and help meet your needs and your goals as you care for your patients. And so we look for input from you. Um, you can also connect with Africa Partners Medical Ghana through their website and their training center. They offer a lot of virtual and in-person trainings throughout the year. And we're looking ahead to our next in-person meeting in October 2023 back in Elmina and more information to come on that. So once again, thanks for all your participation today. We hope you have a good rest of your day and your weekend. And thank you all for the care that you're providing for your patients on a day-to-day -day basis. We're here to support you and encourage you in that. Take care.